It was a pretty average day. I met up with some friends, played a few games, and basically just screwed around. My girlfriend and I had made plans to go see a movie that night, which was the weekly norm for us. We were both avid moviegoers, so any chance to hang out and do what we loved was always fun. This particular night was the release of John Wick 3, and both of us were super fans, so we were pretty excited. I purchased the tickets in advance in case the theater was full. We showed up, and my GF brought the snacks as usual, and we went to the theater. It was decently crowded, as expected on an opening night. We went and found seats in the back, in case things became a little dull and we decided to enjoy each other's company per se, but we were surprised to find a thin, sickly looking man sitting further down the row. We didn't take notice of him for a while as he just seemed normal and we tried to enjoy the movie. About halfway through, I needed to use the restroom and I excused myself and told my girlfriend I'd be back in a few minutes. As I walked down the stairs, I noticed on the opposite side of the room that he was making his way down the stairs as well. Again, this didn't strike me as odd. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and I just assumed he needed to use the restroom too or maybe get popcorn or something. I went into the bathroom and did my business, but as I walked out, I noticed him waiting at the exit. As I passed by, I heard him say, Your friend is pretty. Can I have her? I did a double take and said, Uh, what? He made eye contact and replied, You know, she's beautiful, so how much do you want for her? I very forcefully told him that she was not for sale and not property, then told him to stay far away from us or that I would call the police. He told me that he would wait near the exit just in case I changed my mind. I returned back to my seat, but my girlfriend could immediately tell something was wrong based off the way I looked. I told her that the guy who sat near us earlier was just being creepy, but I didn't tell her what he said because I didn't want to upset her. The movie ended, and as we got up, I remembered what the creep had said about waiting near the exit. I asked one of the staff members if they had seen the guy wandering around based off my description, but they hadn't. My girlfriend then knew something was up, so I told her about what he had said. We both decided that it was best to just try to get to my car, so we made our way out of a side exit to the parking lot. About halfway to our car, I heard a voice yell, Hey, wait up. I glanced around and saw the same man running at us, and he had something in his hands, but I couldn't quite make out what it was. I told my girlfriend to run and we both sprinted for the car. I unlocked it and we hopped in. The guy caught up and tried to force his way in, but by that time I'd already locked the car. My girlfriend had already started dialing the police and I started to back my way out of the parking lot. We drove for a minute before hearing police sirens. Two squad cars pulled up and one went into the direction of the man as another officer stopped to talk with us. More about the situation and what happened. The guy was eventually caught and he was holding a screwdriver and even admitted to the officer that he planned on attacking me and my girlfriend. The night was a huge wake up call to us both and we saw that the world isn't all perfect. Today I decided to take my two children, five and eight, to go see a Sunday manatee at the movie theater. Secret Life of Pets 2 is nearly out of theater so we decided that would be our best bet to beat the crowds. We went to 11.55 a.m. showing and stepped in a bit late to find out that we had the theater all to ourselves and my little kids were thrilled. I allow them to dance around if we are alone in the theater. If others are present, they have to be on their good behavior and stay seated and quiet. Since the movie is older, it was in a room in the very back of the building, far away from anyone or other rooms. Their previews were still rolling when a man, I would say in his late 50s, stepped into the room. He immediately started looking my way as he walked to the row behind me and proceeded to sit down directly behind me. Literally the seat in row right behind mine when the entire theater was empty. Now I know adults can sometimes want to go to a children's movie alone. I realized that alone doesn't make him creepy. However, my gut instinct was this is very bizarre. Toy Story or Lion King, sure, I could understand him being there. This is a very obscure movie and it's a sequel. And beyond that, why would anyone sit right behind me knowing it might look odd that they are even present at this movie in the morning on a Sunday? I immediately got up. I'm about six feet tall and I'll admit I want him to see that I'm no easy target. I moved to the other side of my children and turned so I was facing him. He looked pretty uncomfortable since entering the theater and was very fidgety. His foot was tapping and I quickly snapped a picture of my kids with the camera focused in on him. 
I moved my daughter to my lap so she was out of his reach and was racking my brain on my next move. We were in the very back of this building with the sound blasting and had two small children with me, alone in a huge room with only one door leading out with this stranger. This guy was obviously a creep. You could just tell by his behavior and body language. I thought about complaining to management, but what was I even going to say? I mean, technically, he has every right to be there, so I just kept my eyes on him. The movie started and he watched for a moment, glancing my way and at the screen repeatedly, with his legs still bouncing nervously. I started to form an exit plan in my mind. A minute or two into the film and he got up and hurriedly raced towards the door. I waited a few, hoping he wouldn't return and he didn't. I'm sure I was making him uncomfortable. All I could think was, why would he sit directly behind me in this huge theater room? I wasn't even in the center of the theater and my placement with the kids was very random and not an ideal spot to sit. He could have grabbed me from behind and ran with my kids. He could have been a pervert who wanted to take care of himself while watching my children and I. He never returned, but I'll never forget how he looked. As we left, I stopped by the desk to speak with the manager and another employee. The first thing they said after I showed them his picture and pausing was, there were only three tickets sold to this movie and we don't recognize him as someone who was at one of the other movies either. Those three tickets were for me and my children. The theater complex was completely dead. He had to walk by literally every other movie in this huge movie complex to get to the room this one was in. It was late morning and literally most of the other movies all started at this time. Trust your instincts. Even if you offend someone, I've learned the hard way you have to go with your gut. I don't know what could have happened today and I still have chills thinking about it. It could have been someone movie hopping, but many other films started at that exact time. His seat choice and nervousness tell me otherwise. A few years ago, I had to travel to another town alone. When I arrived, I checked myself in the hotel and went on with my business. Later in the evening, I was free. Being in a place I was visiting for the first time, I decided to look around, maybe shop a little. Staying in the hotel room seemed so boring. I went to a mall and since I had nothing better to do, I decided to see a movie at the cinema there. I checked what movies were showing at the time and chose one which starred in about a half an hour. After I bought a ticket, I had to kill time, so I got an ice cream and sat at a table in the common place. At one of the other tables, a guy was sitting. I didn't pay attention to him and I went on eating my ice cream. Suddenly this guy starts talking to me. It was something about my beautiful eyes and he was just flirting with me. I thanked him and continued to mind my own business. He offered me to join him at his table but I politely refused. I thought the conversation was over now but it seems like he was nowhere near such thought. He continued talking to me like we were old friends. I tried to ignore him at first but I felt like it wasn't right of me and I should be more polite big mistake. He started asking me all kinds of questions and I was dumb enough to answer him. I told him that I was not from here. He said he's also just visiting this town, which now when I think about it, it sounds like a lie to make me feel more related to him. He said he saw me looking at the movie posters and asked me what movie I was going to watch. Of course, silly me, I told him. I didn't really think it would do any harm. But soon enough, his questions started to bother me more and more finished my ice cream as fast as I could and I made some excuse and left. There was still a lot of time until the movie started so I decided to linger in the shops, hoping that the guy will finish his meal and leave before I get back. When I returned, there was no trace of him. Relieved, I went in front of the cinema, waiting the last couple of minutes before they opened the entrance. Just when they opened and people started getting in, guess who came out of nowhere? This creepy guy. He immediately attached himself to me and started talking casually about the movie that we were about to watch. I was already extremely uncomfortable, but I cannot forbid someone to watch a movie. Technically, he didn't do anything wrong, even if he clearly bought the ticket, just because I told him I'm going to watch it. We entered, with him following me, and as I started looking for my seat, eager to get rid of him, he said something which made me shiver. He casually pointed toward a row and said, Hey, here's our seats. My seat number was exactly where he was showing me. I never mentioned it to him. He not only bought the ticket for the same movie, but he also asked which one was my seat and took the adjacent seat. I have no idea why the cashier would give him that information. 
Maybe he lied to her that he's my friend or even boyfriend. I froze at the beginning of the row and calmly said, Go ahead. He continued towards the seats, but I didn't follow him. I sat right there at the very last seat of the row, close to the exit. There were not many people in the cinema, so there was a small chance that I took someone else's place. Luckily, he didn't move. Maybe he finally realized that it's not going to happen. At the end of the movie, I bolted out of there, scared that he might follow me. I haven't seen him ever since. Back in high school, my friends and I would love to go to our local movie theater that was situated inside of our shopping mall. We usually traveled in big groups, but this time it was only my friend Alex and I. We picked a late night showing of some obscure movie, I can't recall the name because this happened years ago, but we arrived on time and found our seats. Since the showing was so late and it wasn't a box office hit, the theater was pretty empty. We situated ourselves in the middle where we could get a perfect view of the screen. Strangely enough, a couple that arrived late decided to sit in our row, with only two seats between us and them. My friend and I exchanged confused looks and then we just shrugged it off, figuring it was solely because we had prime viewing seats. As the theater got dark, things got a little bit weird. The woman of the pair kept looking over at us every few minutes. The first few times, I figured she was just a nervous person and maybe adjusting to her surroundings. Yet maybe an hour into the movie, she just kept the pattern up. She wasn't even discreet with her staring because she turned her head completely towards us. I could see her entire face. I can still see it in my head today when I imagine it. I nudged my friend and told him about the girl staring and he whispered that he'd noticed too. At this point, I was feeling very anxious and almost wanted to leave the movie early. My friend didn't want to though, so I decided staying with him was much safer than leaving alone. And that was his ride home too. Throughout the movie, the girl continued to look over. Every now and then, she'd whisper something to her counterpart, but he himself never really looked over. Once the movie ended, I grabbed my friend by the arm and told him that we should get going because it's late. He followed as I sprinted out of the theater. Once we were out, the halls were empty because of the fact that barely any films played towards the end of the night. I was about to say something to my friend about how the couple next to us had freaked me out, but they ran out the door seconds after us. I was freaking out on the inside, but decided to try my best to keep my composure. My friend was definitely aware of them closely following us out of the theater, but he isn't the type to be confrontational, so we just speed walked to my car. Once we got in the car, my intuition told me just to get out of the parking garage as fast as I could. I saw the weird couple make it to their car, which was on the same parking garage level as us. That wasn't surprising, because the entrance to the mall is on that level, so everyone parks there. I sped out of the parking garage and drove towards the main street. I told them to keep a lookout and see if their blue car was following us. We looked back and said the coast was clear. I felt so relieved. Now, we're the only ones on the main highway because it was late at night and we live in a quiet suburban area. But a few minutes later, a car came speeding up from behind and flashed their high beams at me. My heart started to race and my head just told me it was them. I asked Alex if the car was blue and he said he couldn't tell. The light to turn left onto the next main street was green, so I took the left turn necessary to get to mine in his neighborhood. The car backed off and turned on normal lights, but still turned left too. I caught a glimpse of the car, and I started yelling once I realized that it was the weird couple that I was worried about. Alex told me to gun it, so I slammed on the gas and sped down the last main street before I had to turn into our neighborhood. The car wasn't tailgating me, but was clearly following not too far behind. When the streets are empty, it's easy to follow someone since there aren't other cars to dodge. I turned into the neighborhood but decided to drive past his street so that they wouldn't see where we were trying to go. The car followed us into the quiet neighborhood and was picking up speed to get closer to us. My friend Alex was panicking and asking what we were going to do. I just kept quiet as I sped quickly down street after street. I could see the car's lights behind me as I made a turn onto another side road, but they were far enough that they couldn't see me for about 30 seconds after I took the next turn. After I turned onto another unfamiliar street, I turned my car off and flipped it into neutral gear. My car is manual, so I'm very familiar with driving it and I knew I had enough momentum to roll into an empty parking spot, even though my car was off. I slipped into the spot on the curb and pushed the brakes to get to a stop before the car could clear the turn to get onto the street. 
I reclined my seat back completely and told Alex to lean all the way forward and to not move. We sat there in the silent and dark car with my ears ringing from how quiet it was. My heartbeat was fluttering faster than it ever had before. Within a few seconds, the car cleared the turn and started slowly driving down the street. It made its way past my car that was parked on the side. Luckily for us, I drive a standard black Scion TC. There's nothing notable about the car, and I haven't even changed the license plate frame, so they must have figured that the cars parked on the road belonged to the people that lived in the neighborhood. Alex and I literally stayed in our hiding positions for 10 minutes, just in case the weird couple decided to drive by again. Luckily, they never did. Once we got up, we just stared at each other and didn't know what to say. We were both freaked out and had no idea of what the couple had planned to do if they caught up to us. To this day, I still have no idea what their intentions were. Maybe they were just a couple of deviants who enjoy freaking out young high school students. Or maybe they had a more sinister plan for us. All I know is that I don't go to that theater late at night anymore, unless I'm with a big group of friends. This happened quite a few years ago when I was a relatively young and sheltered high school student, probably about 15 years old. Some of my close girlfriends and I decided to go to the drive-in movie theater one night where they showed two movies in a row and the whole thing ends pretty late at night, probably around 1am or so. The five of us all drive in my friend Aaron's car and as we're putting the seats down and setting the back of the car up with blankets and pillows, I guess Aaron recognizes a guy, David, that she had met with a few times because he worked at her gym. He was at the drive-in alone. Not necessarily weird, just not something many people did in my town. And he came over to our car to chit-chat. Immediately, one of my other friends, Corrine, took a liking to this guy and began flirting up a storm. It wasn't soon until she invited him to watch a movie with us, inside of Aaron's car. It also wasn't soon until this guy David offered us, 15-17 to 17 year olds, alcohol, which we accepted. Looking back now, that's a huge red flag. I was wary of this David character, as he appeared a lot older than us, maybe mid-twenties, and gave me somewhat of a weird vibe. But since Aaron seemed to know him and my friends weren't acting alarmed, I didn't give it too much thought. We're not even 15 minutes into the movie, and I'm just too uncomfortable to be enjoying myself. Six people crammed into the back of one car, and Corrine and David cuddling and flirting, and who knows what else beneath the blankets. Made me want to get out of there as soon as possible. So, when David suggested that me and my three remaining friends could watch the movie in his car while he stayed in Aaron's car and did whatever, I jumped to just take him on the offer. David's car was a small sedan with little room, so we had to sit in the seats normally as if we were about to ride in the car. Although I was a little uncomfortable sitting in the driver's seat with the steering wheel between me and the screen, I was glad to finally have some personal space. But that all changed when I dropped my phone and it landed somewhere underneath the driver's seat. While blindly reaching underneath to find my phone, I grabbed onto a hard object that I realized was a lot heavier than my phone, and I began to lift it up. To my complete and utter surprise, I realized it was a gun. I had never seen a real life gun before at that point in my life, so it could have been fake or a BB gun or whatever else, but it looked real, felt real, and was hidden underneath the driver's seat for easy access. It freaked me out because even if it was a fake gun, what could he be intending to use it for besides intimidation? For whatever reasons, my friends didn't find this as startling as I did, and they managed to calm me down and concluded the best thing to do was to just put it back underneath the seat where I found it. That was fine with me as I didn't plan on ever being in this car again once the movie was over, and definitely didn't plan on being in the car when David was in it, ever. The rest of the two movies went by fine, and we're drinking the beer that this David character so kindly provided to us and I guess having a fun time. It's late by the time the second movie ends and I'm ready to get back to our friend Erica's house where we were sleeping for the night. I hop out of David's car, ready to get back into Aaron's car when I see Aaron's car already driving away. Kareen pops up and cheerfully announces that David has offered to drive us home. How nice of him, right? Having no other way to get home and being slightly intoxicated and watching the rest of my friends pile into the car, I followed suit even though I had my hesitations. David sat in the driver's seat and I sat behind David, and Kareen sat shotgun, beginning to play her signature Justin Bieber playlist through the speakers. The car ride started out normal enough, with Erica giving directions to her house and Kareen not paying attention to anything but her Justin Bieber, and then me feeling uneasy and hyper-aware of the situation. 
As we are approaching Erica's house, David asks us if we have time to take a quick drive up to the reservoir, which was located on the outskirts of town. Very isolated and surrounded by heavily wooded area. It's probably close to 2 a.m. at this point, and the only person who slightly knew this random man has left us, and I know there is a very real looking gun underneath the seat of this guy's car that he doesn't know I know about, so I just say no. David just says, we're going up to the reservoir. Confused and alarmed, I start politely protesting, saying we really don't have time and that we are expected to be home. But with every word I say, David turns the volume of the music up louder and louder, drowning out my voice, obviously ignoring me as he starts to head up to the long, dark road that leads to the reservoir. So I go into panic mode, and I was annoyed that none of my friends are doing anything, especially Kareen, who is still singing along to the songs. At that point, I started to freak out. I decide that he can't take us up to the reservoir, he just can't. What if the gun is real and he threatens us with it, or even if the gun isn't real but he still uses it to threaten us to do something? A million thoughts race through my head. I won't let him take us out into a secluded area where any number of things could happen and no one could hear us. I decided if he's going to do something to us, I would rather risk it being here in town, on a more populated road where our chances of survival or whatever were better. So I literally freaked out. All sense of politeness I felt I needed to have is gone. I start kicking the back of his chair with both of my feet, screaming at the top of my lungs that he needs to take us back now. I roll down the window and start shouting, trying to cause a scene, doing anything I can to try to stop this man from driving us up to the middle of nowhere. I don't stop kicking and screaming until he relents, almost scoffs and says fine, as if I was some crazy lady completely overreacting to the situation but I don't care what he thinks. I'm just relieved that he has turned the car around and is actually taking us back to Erica's house. Once we get there and I run out of the car, we wake up Erica's parents to let them know what happened since this guy now has one of our addresses. I didn't sleep that whole night and my friendship with Corrine was damaged from her putting me in such a terrifying situation just because she had the hots for this guy. This happened to me years ago, and it's by far the most extreme and life-threatening situation I've ever been in. For some understanding, this happened in the United States in the summer of 2012. My longtime boyfriend and I had recently gotten married. Even though we were dirt poor college students and lived in a dinky apartment, we were having a blast. That particular summer, we gathered with our friends at the local movie theater almost every weekend. There was one just down the street from our apartment that had really cheap movie tickets usually. A night out that was under $10 was certainly within our budget. Anyway, one Thursday night I received a call from this group of friends inviting us to watch the midnight premiere of the newest Batman movie. I had just finished working a 12 hour shift and I was really tired. I almost refused the invitation and thought of crashing in my apartment instead. However, I didn't want to miss out on the fun and it was a movie I'd wanted to see for a while anyway. Certainly it wouldn't do any harm to stay up later than usual and miss a few hours of sleep, right? At 10.30 p.m., we met at the theater. We passed large cardboard cutouts of Catwoman and Batman as we walked inside, greeted by the smell of buttery popcorn and the chatter of excited moviegoers. The ticket booth was to the right of the entrance, and just above that was an electronic list of movies being played. The 12 a.m. showing of The Dark Knight Rises was displayed up there in bright red letters. Being paranoid that the tickets would sell out quickly, one of my friends swung by earlier that day and purchased tickets for all of us. We bypassed the ticket line and went straight to the ticket taker. She smiled at us and kindly directed us to the theater, which was on the right side of the lobby, number 9. If only I had known what I'd do now, that among the crowds a killer was lurking, that as I walked across the tacky red and purple carpet towards theater 9, I could have been walking to my death. I think about it often now, what I would have done had I known. Maybe pulled the fire alarm or called the police, or screamed for people to run away. But of course, I had no way of knowing what was going to happen. Oblivious to the peril I was putting myself in, I pushed open the doors for Theater 9 without giving it a second thought. The hallway in this theater was shaped like a U and you could either go right or left. Theater 9 was the largest screening room in the building, perfect for accommodating the crowds that midnight premieres brought in. The screen was motionless and gray. Not even the previews had started yet because there was still a good hour and a half to go until the movie actually started. We entered on the right side, so 
All of the seats were to our left. I remember being surprised at just how packed the theater already was. Just about every seat was filled, much to our dismay. At first it seemed like we couldn't find a spot to sit together. Now the way this theater was set up, there was a section of seats right in front of the screen. This area was flat, and there were about five rows of seating in that section. A lot of seats in that section were empty, but sitting right in front of the movie screen sucks and none of us really wanted to sit there. One of my friends then spotted a row with five empty seats all next to each other, which was perfect for the amount of people we had. These seats were about three to four rows up from where the seating rows start to elevate. We ran up the stairs before someone could take the seats and filled in. My husband Brock sat in the fifth seat and I sat next to him, with my longtime friend Samantha next to me on my right side, and her boyfriend Tommy sat next to her, and then another friend named Leo sat in the aisle seat. We spent the next several minutes just casually chatting and joking around and laughing. After a while, my three friends went to the lobby to buy drinks and that addicting movie theater popcorn. While they were gone, Brock and I passed the time by people watching. The theater was bright since the lights weren't dimmed yet and I could see everyone clearly. There were a lot of people dressed in Batman t-shirts and hoodies. One person even had a mask and one of those shirts with an attached cape. There were a lot of kids in attendance as well, which wasn't surprising because even though it was a Thursday night, it was summer vacation, so that meant no school the next day. Of all the people I saw, the person I will never forget was this little girl sitting in the same row, a few chairs away. She was adorable and blonde with blue eyes, and passed us several times on her way to the lobby, each time coming back with various snacks and popcorn. Overall, people seemed very excited to see the movie and the room was filled with energy and laughter. After what seemed like an eternity of waiting, the lights started to dim and the previews began. Just like every movie I've seen before, a quick animation flashed across the screen, reminding us to get refreshments from the lobby. We were already devouring that popcorn like ravenous animals, to silence our cell phones and to make sure we know where the emergency exits are. The animation had this ugly CGI cat in a tuxedo that was sitting in a movie theater. I casually glanced at the bright green emergency exit signs that were on the left and right sides of the movie screen. I didn't think much of the reminder like usual. After that, I only remember one preview for The Man of Steel. The others I'm not so sure what they were about. When the movie started, the theater erupted into cheering and clapping. Then the title of the movie, The Dark Knight Rises, exploded onto the screen. This was followed by a short scene where Bane is hijacking a plane. I thought that scene was pretty cool and it caught my interest right away. Only when the movie started to get a little less interesting did I remember just how tired I was. I decided I would close my eyes at the more boring parts to get a little bit of rest. I had been awake for about 20 hours at that point so I was rightfully sleepy. My eyes were closed for most of the duration of Batman and Catwoman's encounter. I don't really remember what was going on in that part of the movie. Perhaps some of you have seen it and know what I'm talking about. Anyway, when I opened my eyes again, Bruce Wayne was on his computer digging up information on Catwoman. This is the last scene I saw, and I never got to watch the rest of the movie. All of a sudden, a loud bang erupted from the left side of the theater. I sort of screamed like a little kid because it startled me. A strange smell started to fill the auditorium. It was like the smell of a firework, so I thought it was a cherry bomb or something similar. Had someone thrown fireworks into the crowd as a prank? But then, down near the right side of the movie screen, the dark silhouette of a person caught my attention. They were just a black frame against the bright movie screen. A series of flashing lights was coming from this person. It was a weird moment where time literally slowed down and everything went strangely quiet. I was completely frozen, unable to move and really unable to think at all. It was like my brain had stopped working entirely. Brock caught on immediately to what was happening and he grabbed me. He pulled me to the ground and laid on top of me, shielding me with his own body. At this point, time and sound returned to me. I could hear the gunshots ringing out across the theater. People were screaming. The movie was still playing on top of it all, creating a chaotic explosion of sound. I realized the flashing lights I had seen were bullets flying out of a gun barrel. An instant sensation of adrenaline flooded my body. There was absolutely nothing I could do except lay there and hope to God that the bullets I heard ripping through the sheets and walls wouldn't go through me too. At one point, a shrapnel hit my head, 
cutting off a good chunk of my hair, and as I reached for the spot to make sure it wasn't bleeding, hot pieces of metal fell into my hand. I was lying face up, so I could see everything that was happening. The lights from a still-playing movie danced across the ceiling and walls. My friends were on the floor with me. Our unfinished bucket of popcorn was spilled all across the floor, and Leo had his legs sticking out into the aisle because there wasn't enough room for him to hide completely behind the seats. At some point, Samantha's water bottle, which had been in the cup holder between our seats, exploded. Water splashed all over my face from it. The smell of gun smoke was overwhelming. Riot grade tear gas made me cry and caused me to cough uncontrollably. There was another smell too. The horrible metallic smell of blood that I'll never forget. I remember my lower body feeling wet all of a sudden. For some reason, I thought this came from the leaking water bottle, but I soon realized this wasn't the case. All of a sudden, things went strangely quiet. The bullets had stopped for some reason. Tommy shouted, let's get out of here. We took advantage of the opportunity and made a run for it. We ran down the stairs across the front of the screen towards a bright green exit sign. We crawled into a small closet-like space where the door was. It was so dark, we had a hard time finding it. We were screaming and slamming on the walls to find the door, blinded by tear gas and dumbfounded by shock. Then, finally, my hands felt the metal door handle and I pushed against it with all my strength. The door flew open and the light of a nearby street light flooded our eyes. We pushed against the door so hard that we all fell over onto the concrete. At some point, Samantha lost her pink flip-flops just outside this doorway. As I scrambled to my feet and literally ran for my life, I realized my legs were red, absolutely soaked with blood. It was like I dipped my legs in a bathtub full of it. I checked my body all over and realized I wasn't injured at all. So where had this blood come from? I looked behind me and realized that the blood was my husband's. He had been shot in the leg. A massive gaping hole had ripped through the lower half of Brock's right leg. His foot was barely hanging on and dangled lifelessly. Leo and a young man I didn't recognize were carrying Brock because after falling outside the door, he lost all of his strength and he couldn't walk. I was completely shocked. Had no idea that he had been injured, especially since he was right behind me the whole time and managed to escape the theater all by himself. How he did it on one foot, I'll never know. At this point, I screamed. My scream was so loud that it alerted nearby construction workers. At the back of the theater, there was a narrow parking lot, followed by grass, and then the street beyond that. The construction workers were doing road repair on the street, but as soon as they heard my scream and saw us running, they stopped working and watched what was going on. I'm not sure why this is such a vivid part of my memory. Anyway, they carried Brock along the back sidewalk all the way to the end, where the corner of the building is. This was quite a distance, several dozen feet. My husband then collapsed from exhaustion and pain, saying he couldn't move anymore. He lied down and a puddle of blood started to form beneath him. I looked back and realized we had left a trail of blood leading from the door all the way to our current position. I was trembling. I knelt beside Brock and glanced around to see who else was injured. Tommy had also been shot in the knee and the hip and was further away in the parking lot. The teenager who held my husband was also injured. His dad and mom were with him, with his mom sitting against the wall and looked like she was going to pass out. She was bleeding from several places. That family escaped at the same time we did. I guess they heard the bullets stop and decide to make a run for it too. We were all lucky because the shooting was still going on inside. I had to take off my shirt and use it to stop the bleeding. I'll never forget how lifeless and limp his leg felt. And I imagine that's what a dead body must feel like. I got blood all over my hands and arms. The police showed up really, really fast. I'd say we were only outside for a minute or two before the red and blue sirens filled the night and rushed to our location. We were literally a block away from the police station. A female officer stood by us the whole time until paramedics arrived, which took a very long time. Brock was one of the last to be taken to a hospital. He was bleeding out for almost 20 minutes before an ambulance pulled up on the same street with the road work. At this point, he had become almost unresponsive and was on the verge of unconsciousness. Several massive guys rushed across the grass with a stretcher and loaded him onto it, and then ran with him back to the waiting ambulance. I wasn't able to go with him though because there was another injured person in the ambulance and it was just too crowded. 
I wandered around to the front of the movie theater alone, unsure of where my friends had went. My blood-stained shirt and a pool of blood were left behind on the corner of that sidewalk. Walking through the crowds felt like a dream. I couldn't believe what just happened. People were in hysterics and crying. A lot of people, such as me, were covered in blood, and, like me, I'm pretty sure the blood staining their skin and clothes wasn't their own. A lot of people seemed to notice how lonely and dazed I looked, so they kept me company and even offered me a ride to different hospitals to find Brock, because I hadn't been told what hospital he was being taken to. I hung around these people for a while as police swarmed the area and asked us what we saw inside the theater. The whole parking lot was on lockdown and we weren't going to be allowed to leave anytime soon. It was around 2am so it was very dark outside still and I was pretty cold, wearing only an undershirt and shorts. The flashing red and blue lights of what seemed like a hundred police cars were blinding. I remember seeing a big police vehicle pull up that said something like, Crime Scene Investigation Unit on it. I think that's when it really sank in and hit me. I started to get sick to my stomach and wanted to vomit, but somehow I was able to hold it back. Eventually, police started letting people leave. I jumped into my truck and booked it out of there. I was in such a panic that I didn't even think to go back to my apartment, grab my cell phone, which I had forgotten, and call my parents or someone else to help me. I was angry, upset, and scared, and most of all still in a state of shock. Was I really going to lose Brock, only a month shy of our first wedding anniversary because of some psychopath with a gun? Thankfully, by the time dawn rolled around, I found the hospital he was treated in. This was in the next city over, maybe 45 minutes from the theater if you're going the speed limit. I was just so happy to be there and the hospital staff were also welcoming and understanding. After making sure I wasn't injured as well, they let me wait in the ICU room that Brock would be placed in when he was done recovering from surgery. I was just so happy that he was alive. Brock and Tommy both had survived, though many others weren't so lucky. I found out the following day, after some much needed sleep on a hospital couch, that 12 people were killed in the shooting and over 70 were injured. I remember they first thought 15 people were killed, but the real number was 12. The little blonde girl sitting in my row did not survive. She died in the theater no more than a few feet away from us. She had been shot multiple times. A heartbroken police officer, who cried during his court testimony, tried unsuccessfully to save her by carrying her out of the theater and having her sent to a hospital. Tommy was rushed to a different hospital in the back of a police car. He underwent surgery and made a full recovery. The bullet missed his hip bone and narrowly missed his urinary tract and bladder. According to the surgeons, my husband lost almost half of his blood. Brock made it to the hospital just in time. Any later and he probably would have died. He underwent several blood transfusions and was in the hospital for 21 days. The wound to his leg was severe enough that they had to amputate it after trying unsuccessfully to save it. It's been so long since the shooting happened that my husband, friends, and I have been able to recover from it somewhat. The event was pretty horrifying and has left us scarred for sure. I wouldn't consider that part of the story to be creepy though. No, the creepy part is the shooter himself. I later learned much about him from the murder trial that would follow in the coming years. Though my encounter with this man was very brief, he has affected my life greatly. Just to know that people like this exist is just disturbing. He is certainly one twisted individual that I never want to see again. I learned everything I needed to know from watching the televised trial that took place in early 2015. This guy was going to school for neuroscience or something in California. Supposedly, he was actually a pretty smart guy. However, for some reason, he had an obsession with killing people and had a stalker mentality. After dropping out of his university, he moved to my state and chose my local theater to commit a mass shooting. Before that, he was planning on hiding along remote hiking trails up in the mountains and jumping people and pulling them into the woods and killing them there, though he never went through with that idea. He stalked my theater for months and had this shooting all planned out for the night of July 20th. Though I never saw him before this, it's unnerving to think that this guy could have been watching us every time we went to the theater and we would never have known it. We were completely unaware of what he had planned against us. This completely ruined my sense of security because who knows what the stranger next to you is planning on doing to you. I came very close to the shooter but I never actually saw his face in person until I was forced to testify in court. 
Of course, I saw his mug shots on television, but while in the theater, I only saw him as a dark silhouette in the shadows, like a demonic figure rendered from the darkest and most sinister nightmare. He was even in the hallway that we passed upon running for the emergency exit. The only thing stopping him from killing us there and then was his jammed assault rifle. To commit this crime, he ordered a few thousand rounds of ammunition, riot gear and armor, tear gas, an assault rifle, and a shotgun. He also took pictures of himself, which were shown in court, wearing all of this gear like some sick trophy and holding up these weapons with a menacing smile. He dyed his hair orange and put in these creepy black contacts while making devilish faces into his camera, something that made me sick just looking at. Before driving to the theater with all of his gear in his car, he booby-trapped the entire apartment and set it to explode if anyone opened the door. Then once at the theater, he posed as a moviegoer and even bought a ticket for the movie. I think his ticket had Theater 8 on it, which was the next door, but Theater 9 had more people in it, so he went into number 9 instead. He was in the few front rows. I must have passed him several times in the lobby while he was there. Maybe he had seen me too. At some point during the movie, he got up and went through the side exit, which didn't have an alarm for some reason. He kept it propped open with something, then went to his car, put on all of his armor and grabbed his weapons. Then he came back inside and started shooting. When we escaped the theater, we ran past his white car, which was parked right at the exit. We didn't even notice it. At some point, he even came outside and he would have seen us there on the concrete. I don't know what stopped him from shooting people that were outside too, but he could have easily ended us there and then if he wanted to. I think the hardest part for me was facing this twisted individual in court. I'll never forget rising as they called my name, walking down the center row past my family, other survivors and crowds of news-hungry media personnel. I sat right across from him, maybe only 10 feet away. While his orange hair was gone and he wasn't wearing black contacts, being so close to him was creepy and uncomfortable experience. My encounters with this man are certainly ones I will never forget. I can now say that I've come face to face with a true deranged psychopath. He just had this blank stare in his eyes the whole time. If eyes truly are the windows to the soul, then his soul was filled with nothing but a cold indifference for those who he had murdered and harmed. He wouldn't even look at me. Sitting across from in court was the second time I had knowingly been in the same room with this man. A man who had tried to take my life, but thankfully failed. A man who would end up spending forever behind bars when, at the end of it all, he was sentenced to 3,318 years in prison for his crimes. This is to the man who tried to kill me. The man who had caused countless nightmares and fueled the fires of my paranoia. The man who hurt my friends and family, causing years of untold grief for my husband because he will never walk the same again. The man who stole the innocence and joy from a six-year-old child who went into that theater alive and came out dead. To the man who carried out the worst mass shooting in Colorado history, I hope you rot in prison. While at the movies, I decided to go pee before the film started, just after the trailers had finished. I bought and thirstily siphoned a large slushie and had no confidence in my sensitive bladder surviving the two and a half hour experience. When I entered the bathroom, it was empty. All the stall doors were open and the spaces within unoccupied. There wasn't anywhere for someone to have hidden themselves at my entrance. I went to the first urinal in the row nearest to the sinks and started doing my business. But a few seconds later, someone stepped up to the farthest urinal to my left. I was fairly attuned to the ambience of the bathroom, or rather the sounds of the nearby theaters, and hadn't heard anyone enter. Nevertheless, someone apparently did, and they were at the far end of the row. They somehow slipped right behind me. Something about their presence immediately unnerved me, and I hastened to finish what I had started. I didn't look directly at them, but glimpsed what I felt was a fairly normal appearance. Black jacket, jeans, and sneakers. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about them and almost had a very misfortunate and unimaginably painful accident as I hurriedly zipped up. Stepping away from the stall, I took a glance in their direction and saw them staring right at me. The bathroom was lit fairly brightly with several lights situated throughout the ceiling, above both the urinals and the stalls, and of course above the sinks. There was little room for shadows and yet the man's entire face was shaded. 
He had no hat and his hair was short cut and parted at the forehead. His posture was relaxed and yet the weirdly and darkened face put me on edge. Made me feel like he meant me harm in some way. I nervously laughed, unsure of what else to do, and stepped back, half turning toward the sinks, wanting to keep him in my peripheral vision in case he suddenly charged at me. Even as I started washing my hands, he remained standing by the urinals, face still hidden, veiled by some sourceless shadow. I looked away for a single second, maybe half a second, a habitual glance at my reflection to assure that there were no crumbs or crud on my face. And upon returning toward the man, I saw that he had somehow disappeared in that brief moment. Unfortunately, I saw him again, now reflected in the mirror, standing in front of the bathroom's exit, blocking it. Turning away from the sink now, the little alarms in my brain signaling off one by one, I struggled to keep myself under control. Not yet certain that the stranger was serious in his confrontational, or at least unsettlingly provocative behavior. I was frightened, no doubt about that, but also angered. He was keeping me from my movie, for which I'd paid the steep IMAX prices. Finally breaking the speechlessness of the moment, I asked what he was doing. He didn't respond, just kept staring at me, with his face still unexplainably withheld from view. Had I not sensed something uniquely off about this man, I might have tried pushing him aside, but there was something so inexpressibly eerie about his presence, so fundamentally wrong, that I decided to instead do something pretty ridiculous. I took out my phone and with the camera's flash activated, I took a picture of him. The plan was to threaten him with some sort of legal action if he didn't get out of my way, having the picture of him blocking the bathroom door as evidence of his arguably hostile behavior. The man didn't flinch at the camera's flash or make any moves or gestures to indicate that he had an issue with the picture, which I of course found unnerving. But what I found absolutely terrifying and what sent me running for one of the stalls was what I saw on my phone screen. In the picture, the man's face wasn't covered by darkness. Everything else was dark, and only a shockingly white face showed clearly. Its eyes were two leaking pools of black, which joined with the equally black mouth at the bottom of the chinless face. There was no nose, only those three portals of drooping molten darkness. The almost lustrous ivory face seemed to float amidst the pitch black background, hovering spectral visions of unwholesomeness. I locked myself in the middle stall, my usual preference, under less terrifying circumstances, and crouched atop the toilet. Just then, the lights of the bathroom went out, all at once, a soft noise arose. Raspy, stuttered breathing, like that of some mummy newly arisen from its age-old tomb. A few breathless on my part moments later, there was a sound to my right, at the first of the five stalls. I heard the sound of shattering porcelain and splashing water, which and the oddly acoustic confines sounded thunderous. Another second passed and I heard the same sounds from the next stall, the one immediately to my right. At the destruction of that stall's toilet, I started to whimper, fearing for my life. Then with a scream more horrific than anything I'd ever heard, the door of my stall was nearly broken off its hinges as something crashed into it. Three more screams rang out, each followed by a stall-shaking impact. Somehow, through the mercy of God or the architectural aptitude of the bathroom's designers, the stall door held. The screaming, assaulting horror eventually relented, moving on to inflict its insane violence against the other two remaining stalls. Their toilets were mercilessly smashed to bits. At the completion of the violence, the lights came back on. Despite this, I remained perched atop the toilet for at least ten more minutes, listening for even the slightest sound of someone or something lurking beyond the stall. Finally, after saying a prayer or two, I unlocked and opened my stall door and peered out into the bathroom. The floor was coated in water and littered with the shards of shattered toilets, but there was no one around. No man with his face obscured by shadows, no floating face. On my fear-weakened legs, I wobbled out of my stall and at this moment, someone entered the bathroom. Someone plainly, wonderfully normal. They saw me, leaning weakly against the counter of the sinks and saw the wreckage of the other toilets and said, Did you have that chili cheese dog too? It's messing me up, man. I went home after that. I'll see the movie another time. I-17 female work in a movie theater. I'm usually cashier, but sometimes I have the responsibility of cleaning the theaters. Anyways, one night, my boss told me that I would be responsible for cleaning because some of the staff went home early. 
I was a little bit annoyed because I was super tired and the time was already 12.34 a.m., but I needed the money and I only needed to clean three theaters. I packed up my cleaning supplies and made my way to theater 12. I opened the door and started sweeping up all the popcorn and then wiping the seats. I then threw away all the empty cups and after 15 minutes or so, I was done. I packed up my supplies and started walking towards theater 16. I cleaned up all the spills and popcorn grease that was on the seats. After 20 minutes, I was done cleaning that one. I then walked to theater 4 and I opened the door and started sweeping up the popcorn on the floor. But as I was sweeping, I heard a giggling sound. Right when I looked up, the giggling stopped. I looked around but I didn't see anyone. I then yelled, is anyone in here? But no one answered, so I yelled, no one is supposed to be here. I was getting annoyed but I decided to forget about it and started wiping the seats in the first row. After a few seconds, I heard the same giggling sound. I stood there and listened. At this point, I was just getting pissed off. The giggling slowly started turning into cackling. I was creeped out, but I was also mad. I had to yell out in an angry voice, who's there? But I got no response. I started walking up the stairs, and as I was walking up, the sound got louder and louder. I was getting more and more scared. I started thinking of the worst. I was no longer mad because all the anger was replaced with fear. Right when I got to the 10th row, the cackling stopped. I was super freaked out. I held my breath so I wouldn't make any noise. Then I started to turn around because I was really scared and wanted to just get out of that theater. But right when I turned around, I heard the laughing again. I turned back around and looked up the stairs, but I still couldn't see anyone or anything. It was just too dark. I started walking back up the stairs. Eventually, I made it to the last row, which was the 16th. There was a small gap behind the seats and the wall, maybe about a foot gap. The cackling was so loud at this point and obnoxious. I turned my head to look into the gap. It was dark, but I could still see the face of a creepy guy. He was crouched down and staring up at me, and he had a big smile on his face. Right when we made eye contact, he stopped laughing. He raised his finger to his lip and whispered, Shh. After that, he said loudly, Boo. Right when he said this, I actually screamed. I turned around and ran down the stairs, and he tried to grab me, but luckily he missed. He chased me down the stairs and was screaming the whole time. I eventually made it to the big wooden doors, and I opened them and closed them in his face. I ran to one of the employees and told him about the man. My coworker called the police. A few minutes later, the police arrived and went into the theater. Five minutes later, the cops came out with a man in handcuffs. The man was still cackling and screaming. He was wearing dirty clothes and had greasy long hair. I quit the job a few weeks later. I still have nightmares about this guy and I'm just glad that I escaped him.